I'm Alex Michelson. This week, the issue is controversies over California's curriculum. With us, California's Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman. Then, the issue is standing up to cancer. Katie Couric joins us as the issue is starts right now. Broadcasting across California, you're watching The Issue Is. And welcome to The Issue Is. I'm Alex Michaels, and with us, the state's superintendent of public instruction in studio for the first time, Tony Thurman. Welcome back to The Issue Is. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, so uh, all these students, millions of students, are preparing to go back to school right now. Some have already gone back to school. Yes. And one thing that's top of mind going forward in this state is ethnic studies. Yes. Uh, thanks to you and others, this is now going to be a part of the curriculum in California going forward. Can you explain a little bit about what we're talking about and, and what we're looking at? Yeah, you know, we have a beautifully diverse state. And so when we talk about ethnic studies, we're giving students a chance to learn about students from different backgrounds and about the contributions that, um, you know, people of color have made for this state. And it actually is something that helps students to do better academically and socially. And so it's a great movement. By 2030, we have a graduation requirement that every high school will provide uh, a course in ethnic studies. And we're in the process of showing school districts how to build out an ethnic studies curriculum. So it's a great time. Uh, obviously, you've been in the news a lot uh, over this fight over transgenderism yeah. and how to talk about that in yeah. schools. Yeah. Um, there have been some pushes that parents should be notified if their kid wants to identify with a different pronoun than what's on their birth certificate. You spoke out against one of those efforts at the Chino Valley Unified School District, and this is what happened. It's a point of order. As the board no president, order, this is not your meeting. You may have a seat because if I did that to you in Sacramento, you would not accept it. Please sit. Can I get a point of order? You're not going to blackmail us. So the board there essentially kicking you out um, after you had gone over the allocated time there um, without getting into the specifics back and forth with that yeah. meeting. Uh, on the issue itself, yeah. what is the main point you were trying to make there in places like Murrieta, other places where yeah. this is now in the news? The main point I was making is that it is dangerous to ask someone to out students regarding their sexual identity. Many of our students are not in places where they can be safe, if that's known. And um, nearly half of the students in our state who identify as LGBTQ+, have considered suicide. And so I'm really just trying to keep our students safe. Look, I support parent rights. I'm a parent. I get it. And I just think we have to find a better balance of parent rights and keeping students safe and forcing school staff to say this is how a student is identifying could carry a consequence. And that's really the only message that I was bringing to the board. Uh, look, we know that there are some parents that are abusive and that are kind of like monsters, yeah. but most parents aren't. That's right. They come from a place of love and they want to be involved with their kids. That's right. And a lot of them feel like they should be told. Why should the state keep this secret from parents? What do you say to parents concerned about that? I would say it's actually not about keeping a secret from parents. I think, again, parent rights are important. Parents have a way of being involved in decision-making about what happens at a school, what a student learns. And um, I just think we have to acknowledge, right? I spent a lot of time around young people. And what I've learned is even in the best situations, it is very difficult for a student to talk about their sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And if we start telling staff who they don't know to be the ones to say what this person is or how they identify, that carries a consequence for our students. We should be encouraging parents and students to work that out together. Um, I don't disagree with those who say that this is a parent right. Uh, I, I also think it's just an overreach and an overstep to say that now we're asking classroom teachers and school staff to be responsible for having conversations with parents about the sexual orientation of their child. Um, and so now we're, we're looking at, the Attorney General has mentioned the concept of potential lawsuits against yes. some of these districts that are trying to force this. What's yes. the status of that? And do you think that they're committing civil rights violations? I think there's a pretty uh, clear body of law that says that students, like other Californians, have a right to some privacy. I think this has been debated in different courts and at different levels. But I think that there are issues at play here. And I do believe that these actions may very well fall outside of our laws and our traditions as it relates to privacy. So your point would be that the student's right to privacy is more important than the parent's right to know. 
I wouldn't equate it that way. I think we can find a better balance. And I've taken this issue up with a number of parents. I've appointed a statewide parent advisory council, and I've asked the parents to work with me to think through how do we balance parents' rights mm -hmm. with also keeping students safe. Meanwhile, you know, we, we look at the state of our schools and we're yeah. dealing with learning loss yes. from the pandemic. Yes, um, no doubt. A lot of people were operating in good faith during the pandemic, but yes. now we have the opportunity to look back at that yes. with 2020 hindsight yeah. and, and analyze what we did right, what we did wrong. Sure. Knowing what we know now, did we keep schools in California closed for too long? You know, it's hard to say. A million people died from COVID. And I, I think that California took the right measures to keep everyone safe. Our biggest challenges, I think, around learning loss stem from the fact that we went into the pandemic with a million students who did not have access to a computer or access to high-speed internet. I don't know how that exists in California, but since then, we've made sure that we've provided a million computers and funding to have broadband all across the state. But we know that California kept schools closed longer than other states that did not have catastrophic health outcomes by bringing students back. I mean, if we were to go through another pandemic and you're in charge, either as superintendent or governor or some other role, it, what are the lessons learned from what we did right and what we did wrong? It's sad. The reality is, even with the time that California schools may have taken longer than other states to open, all across the nation, students experience learning loss. The number one thing we can do to help our students is the work that I'm leading right now to recruit 10,000 counselors to address the mental health needs of our students who experience depression and anxiety. And we can do more tutoring and more literacy programs to make sure our students bounce back and they're ready for the jobs of tomorrow. All right, well, coming up next, we wanna have a little bit of fun. We okay. wanna to get to know the superintendent a little bit better. Yeah. You've got an incredible backstory that I think a lot of people don't know. Yeah. So we're interested to tell it. Sure. And as we go to break, we like to play music. Okay. Uh, so we're going to break with some music that I think is fitting for back to school okay. from the Jackson 5. The ABC. Take it away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're back with California Superintendent of Public Instruction, Tony Thurman. Uh, thanks so much for being here again. Um, uh, for a lot of people that may not know that much about you and your background, I think you've got an incredible sort of life story. Talk to us about the beginning yeah. uh, and, and a little bit about, you know, how you got to where you are. Sure. Yeah. Like most Californians, you know, my story is about overcoming humble beginnings. You know, my um, grandparents were immigrants who came here. My dad, a Vietnam vet who never came home from the war, was raised by my mom, who took care of four kids, a teacher here in our state, um, took care of us until she couldn't. My mom had cancer. Mm. When I was six years old, she lost her battle to cancer. Um, uh, I was born here in California, but got shipped to uh, the East Coast to be raised by a cousin who I never met until I showed up on her doorstep. Mm. And uh, she too, an immigrant, um, she took me in and raised me and my younger brother. And um, a lot of times we didn't have the things we needed. You know, I grew up on the free lunch program on public assistance and I ate a lot of government cheese, um, mm. that cheese in a box. And um, you know, the, the sandwiches sometimes, the cheese was this thick on the sandwich, but you know, we didn't have much. These programs helped my family to overcome poverty. And um, nothing was more important than getting a great education in terms of overcoming poverty. And it allowed me to overcome those humble beginnings, uh, go to college, become a social worker, work with foster youth and young people coming out of the juvenile justice system and spend the last 15 years elected city council member, school board member, state legislator, and now uh, state superintendent. And I'm, I'm grateful for my experiences here in this state. It's been good to me and I wanna continue serving our folks here. Um, and, and you've, the combination of both black and Latino in, yes. in your background as well. Yeah, my grandmother um, emigrated from, um, from Colombia and went to Panama and then to the U.S. And so I'm half Panamanian, so I grew up a, you know, Afro-Latino. Mm. And I'm also mindful of my grandparents who are the descendants of slaves. Mm. And that as we try to overcome the impacts of racism and slavery, um, that we have to continue to do all that we can to support African Americans, Latinos, and all people in our state. That's pretty profound. Um, let's talk for a moment about your future. Yeah. Uh, you have said that you've formed an exploratory committee to yes. look into the idea of running for governor. Yes. How's the exploration going? Are you running yeah. for governor? <laughs> well, the exploration has been great. I get to travel a lot in the course of my work. Uh, I'm mindful that my number one job 
is to do a good job of what I'm doing right now. And right now we're working to bring preschool to every four-year-old, universal meals to every hungry student, um, making sure that our students learn to read by third grade and that they get computer science training so they're ready for the future. Um, but everywhere I go, um, people say, we want you to run. We, we need your service. And, and from my standpoint, it's an honor um, to be asked um, to continue on the mission of helping the people uh, of the state of California. Well, I'm not a betting man, but if I was a betting man based on what you said, I would put a lot of money on the fact that it sounds like you're running. But okay, <laughs> we'll see. If you ever want to make the announcement, feel free to come back and, uh, and do it right here. We'll make you uh, the first today. Yeah, there we go. Uh, but let's get to know you because it sounds like you're running. So we, we, we really need to know more about you and, and your background. Uh, and we're going to do a game called Personal Issues okay. uh, where we get to know your cultural favorites. I know you've okay. seen this before. So this yeah. is 30 seconds. We'll put the clock up and uh, get to know some of your favorites. So here right. we go. What's... Uh, uh, what's your favorite TV show? Wow. Favorite TV show, um, ESPN. Okay, Sports Center, baby. What's your favorite book? Favorite book? Um, anything that young children can read. I love reading to kids yeah. and telling a story with young people. All right, we'll say Gavin Newsom's children book. Uh, what's your favorite school subject? Uh, favorite subject would be um, history. And what's your favorite sports team? Favorite sports team? Well, it's a big state. I root for all of the California teams. <laughs> the state, so. Well, one I, I hope you root for is the Lakers. And we've got a picture of you with the Showtime Lakers, who a lot of people are thinking of right now for winning time. Let's put this up on the screen. <laughs> um, and look at this guy. Uh, how about that? I mean, as a fan of them, how cool was this moment? It was a great day. Uh, I've done a lot of work with um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and his Skyhook Foundation. Yeah. You know, when I got sent to Philadelphia, I always wore number 33 on my jersey, just like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Oh, so. that's pretty wild to be able to be hanging out with him. Yeah, yeah. good for you. Um, well, I didn't ask you your favorite song, but I, I heard through the grapevine that your favorite, one of your favorite songs is Curtis Mayfield's Love Move it. On Up, which Love is such it. a good song. Why do you like it so much? It's got a great message um, about staying in there and working hard for the community. And it's just a great beat, and it's great to dance to. It is a great beat. So now we get a chance to dance. All right. We're up next is Katie Kirk and Stand Up to Cancer. But first, <laughs> Curtis Mayfield and the superintendent. Take it away. <laughs> the end of the colon. In 2000, Katie Couric got a colonoscopy on the Today Show after her husband Jay died of colon cancer. What happened next is called the Couric effect. Scheduling of colonoscopies jumped 20%. In 2008, Couric established Stand Up to Cancer. Here's some stats of what they've accomplished. It's pretty impressive. Uh, we're talking over 130 science grants, nine FDA approvals, worked with 210 plus institutions, 3,000 scientists, 270 plus clinical trials. What a legacy for our next guest, Katie Couric. Hi, Katie. Great to see you. Alex, always great to be with you as well. Well, you're back home in New York right now. Nice fireplace, by the way. Um, but Thank we want to show you some photos of some uh, recent shoot here in Los Angeles. Here are some behind the scenes pics from Stand Up to Cancer 2023. Uh, which, by the way, airs on all the major TV networks, including this one, on Saturday, August 19th at 8 p.m. Big Star is part of this. Uh, it isn't part of the, the SAG after strike, by the way, which is why the stars are able to be a part of this. Uh, Katie, what's new and exciting this year? Well, gosh, you know, this year really is our 15th anniversary. So it's a celebration, Alex. When we started Stand Up to Cancer, Alex, we were all really... Um, flummoxed actually by the notion that a lot of scientists and researchers didn't share their knowledge breakthroughs and their leads with each other and it was a very siloed affair and so our whole strategy is to change the paradigm of cancer research we feel like if two heads are better than one 10 heads are better than two and as a result we can move science forward faster. It's one thing to talk about this in the abstract. It's quite different when you talk about a personal story. And you've met some pretty extraordinary people along the way. Oh, gosh, have we ever, Alex? You know, and we profile some of the patients who are here with us today because of Stand Up to Cancer research. Emily Whitehead is adorable. She, I've known her since she was a little girl. She had... Uh, lymphoblastic leukemia 
when she was five years old, she was diagnosed and she was part of a stand up to cancer clinical trial. Uh, she is cancer free and going to the University of Pennsylvania this fall. We also have a profile of another young mother named Kelly Spill and she was diagnosed with rectal cancer and she was part of a clinical trial at Memorial Sloan Kettering. She was treated, she's part of a subset with a particular genetic mutation. She was cured and she just had her second baby. Ah. Honestly, these profiles, these stories, I guarantee you, Alex, they'll make you cry, but happy tears. Right. Because and it's so wonderful to see people not only, you know, uh, surviving cancer, but really thriving and, and on their way to, to long, productive lives. Well, and, you know, this story for you became really personal when you yourself were diagnosed with breast cancer. In fact, your colleague was filming what was supposed to be a routine exam when this happened. Here's your doctor. And when I got to that area on ultrasound, what I saw was a mass and that mass had irregular margins. And I looked at you and I looked at the person who was imaging us and I said, I think we really need to turn the camera off. I, I, I want to speak frankly. So can I stop for a second here? Pretty dramatic to see that. How are you doing now? Well, thank you for asking. I'm doing really, really well. In fact, I am sort of living proof of the importance of screening. I, I, can't, I couldn't believe it. I mean, stage 1A cancer. So last summer I had a lumpectomy. In the fall I had radiation. And I'm very, very lucky. You know, my husband Jay, as you know, Alex, died of colon cancer in 1998. He was diagnosed just nine months prior to that with mm. stage four metastatic colon cancer. My sister Emily, just a few years later, was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and it had metastasized to her liver. And then to, to be the beneficiary of technology and screening that literally saved my life, I felt so, so much gratitude. Mm. And, but also, again, frustration that so many women and so many people in this country don't necessarily have access to the medical technology and the people who can detect their cancer at a stage where it's most treatable. And that's something that Stand Up to Cancer is also really focused on that I'm particularly proud of is, is reducing health disparities. Well, let's have a little bit of fun because while you were out here in LA to uh, check out or to, to film Stand Up to Cancer, you also checked out the Taylor Swift concert at SoFi I Stadium. Here is a pic of you with your daughters, Carrie and Ellie, and, and you've interviewed Taylor Swift several times over the years, which I think helped you get some really good seats there. I mean, really <laughs> amazing. I mean, <laughs> we've got some video that I, you I shot. I don't know. I at, I think Capital One was pretty helpful okay, too. They sponsored go. the tour. Okay. <laughs> so here's some of the video that you shot. Look how close you are. You could almost touch her. So uh, what was it like to describe the concert? Oh my gosh. First of all, she's so incredibly talented and indefatigable, I might add. She performs for three and a half hours. Her music, I mean, she is sort of the consummate storyteller. For me, seeing her uh, literally grow up before our eyes and talking to her and watching her, she's just an inspiration. And she's such a great role model, I think, for young girls everywhere. Yeah, it's been quite a, a, a time for female empowerment. The Barbie movie just crossed a billion dollars at the box office with a, a, strong, awesome? a strong message about sexism. As someone who may have experienced a little bit of sexism over the years, maybe. Uh, oh, <laughs> you, you think a little, a little you here and there. How do you process this moment in time? I think it's incredible. I think, you know, culture, entertainment, the arts has such a huge impact on the way we see ourselves. And I also think it's just great to see, you know, people realize that what were once dismissed as chick flicks 
can be box office gold. So we've got, you know, women make up what 50.8 or 50.3 percent of the population. I should double check that, Alex, because I don't want to have fake news on your channel. But, um, <laughs> you know, we're more than half of the population, put it this way. And, you know, and we we have a lot of disposable income and we want we want art that speaks to us. And I think you're seeing that and it's incredibly powerful. All right, we're gonna end with something uh, uh, fun. This is called our personal issues game. 30 seconds, uh -oh. first thing that comes to mind. Uh, these are some of more of your cultural favorites. All right, here we go. Ready? Uh, last TV show you binged? Uh, uh, the Bear. All time favorite TV show? Oh God, uh, all time favorite TV show. I don't know, I don't know. Uh, the Mary Tyler Moore Show. Uh, favorite movie of all time? Oh, I always uh, often say The Shawshank Redemption or My Brilliant Career with Judy Davis. I love that movie and it was very formative for me as a young woman. All right, there we go. We're out of time. Uh, but That's it? We, we do want to, <laughs> it's 30 seconds. You took so long. Okay, answer. sorry. That's sorry. okay. Uh, but uh, we want to remind everybody, stand up to Cancer Telecast next Saturday night. Katie Kirk, thank you for being here. And we end with some of the music you provided from the Taylor Swift concert, your chance to rock out. Here we go. Let's do it. Katie, take Thanks, it away. Thanks, Alex. <laughs> Next week on The Issue is Fox News anchor Brett Baer is with us to preview the GOP debate and an exclusive one-on-one -on -one with presidential candidate Vivek Ramaswamy at the Nixon Library. We end this week, though, with one final look at those Taylor Swift concerts. Check out this picture of Issue Is producer Greg Lindsay. Well, that's his daughter there, my Lynn. And look at Greg's shirt. Dads are Swifties, too. <laughs> we wrap things up with Greg's concert video. We'll see you next week.